Maintaining a campfire can sometimes be an arduous task, especially during the earlier stages, when you need to constantly keep feeding sticks in the fire until it gets hot enough to create coals. One of the ways to create a low maintenance fire is by building it upside down. By that, I mean start by sawing off a few lengths of large dry logs. The thicker and longer the log that you cut, the bigger your fire will be. For this example, I'm cutting a length of around 40 centimeters and roughly 10 centimeters in diameter. In layman's terms, that's basically a log the length of my forearm. The species of wood that I am using here is ash, which burns well on a campfire. The important thing to remember is to choose the driest wood possible. Next, I cut a load of smaller sized logs to the same length. I then use my ax to split some of these smaller logs in half to expose the dry inner wood. And now for the fun part, I start by building the fire upside down. First, I lay down the thickest logs. Then I lay the thinner ones perpendicular to the ones below. On top of those, I lay the split logs with the exposed wood facing upwards. I continue to build the fire lay until all of the split logs are used. It's kind of like making a Jenga tower. At the top of the fire, I lay small dry twigs. Now all you need to do is light a fire on top and watch as the magic happens. This time, I decided to light the fire with a traditional flint and steel method. I strike the steel down onto the sharp piece of flint, which causes sparks to catch onto the char cloth. I then place the char cloth into the tinder bundle, which is the bark of the honeysuckle vine. I blow some air into the tinder bundle to force oxygen in, and then the fire ignites. I add a few thin strips of silver birch bark, which will help to extend the flame. Then I just add a few twigs to build the initial flame up, and I can sit back and let the fire burn. There is no need to go and hunt for more firewood to keep adding to the fire. Each layer burns and then the coals drop onto the layer below, which allows the fire to continue burning. Here is what the fire looks like after 30 minutes. It's burning with a hot, clean flame. And here is what it's like after one hour. And finally, here is the fire after an hour and a half. I have not had to add any sticks to the fire in this time. These coals would be great for cooking on. So, whilst the initial part of collecting the firewood takes a bit of time, once the fire gets going, it requires very little maintenance. The fire would have probably burned for longer if it wasn't such a windy day. Whilst this fire is burning, let's take a look at a method you can use to boil some water over it. I cut three sticks to equal length. Then I lay the sticks next to each other and secure them with some bank line. The knot I use to secure them is an arbor knot. Once the arbor knot is cinched tight, I take a number of wraps of the cordage around the sticks. Normally three wraps does it. Then I do some vertical wraps that weave in between the sticks and over the horizontal cordage. These are known as fraps, and these help tighten the whole lashing. Again, I do these about three times in between each gap. With the knot secure, I can lift up the sticks and form a tripod. The lashing will tighten as I splay the legs out. You'll notice I have deliberately left a length of bank line. At the end of this line, I'm going to tie a marlin spike hitch. It's a dead easy knot. Apologies for the out of focus shot here, but you can still see how it's tied. First, I make a loop in the end of the line. Then I bring that loop up to the center line above it to form another loop. I then pass a stick through the loop and behind the center line. Then I cinch the knot tight against the stick. Now I can pass this stick through the bail arm of a billy can, and it allows me to hang the billy can directly above the fire. The cord will spin for a few minutes as it's been twisted up where it has been stored in my backpack. To get the billy can closer to the heat of the fire, I just widen the tripod legs. The great thing about small hatchets over large axes is that they are portable. You can often carry some of the smaller ones on your belt. The issue I found with having them tucked into your belt is that they can really restrict movement. You can eliminate this by using a simple piece of paracord. Take a piece of the cord, bring the ends together and tie them in a knot. This creates a loop. Now pass this loop through your belt and then pass the knot through the loop like you would with a prussic knot for tying onto the ridge line of a tarp. Pull the knot tight and you have yourself a small loop dangling from your belt. Now you can pass the handle of your hatchet through this loop and it will sit close to your hip, but not too tight that it restricts your movement. Whenever you go to kneel down, the axe moves freely. 
It's also dead easy to deploy whenever you need to use it. Once you're done, just loosen the loop and pull it free from your belt. You can keep this piece of cordage in your kit ready to deploy whenever you need to use it. It doesn't have to be used for just hatchets too. I've also used it for carrying a water bottle on me. Despite being dead for years, the roots of a pine tree are one of the last things to decompose. When a pine tree has broken branches, it tends to send this resin to these affected areas to prevent bugs and bacteria from causing disease to the tree. When a tree is blown over in a storm, it sends the resin to the root system. This provides a valuable resource for fire lighting. Cut off a root as close to the base of the stump as possible. You'll know you've struck gold when you see the dark red resinous area on the open end of the cut. These natural oils are what make it that colour and they are very flammable. Take your knife and strip off the outer bark of the root. Whilst this can still burn, it's the resinous layer beneath it that you really need. Use the back of your knife to scrape off fine shavings of the resinous wood. If your knife doesn't have a sharp spine, you can use the blade, but over time you'll want to sharpen your knife edge as doing this often will start to dull your blade. Now use your fire steel to scrape off some sparks into the fine resin shavings and they will readily ignite. They burn for a considerable amount of time, allowing you a bit more freedom to place fine twigs on top and begin to grow your fire. The great thing about using this resin to light a fire is that it burns well even in wet weather. You'll notice black smoke emitting from the flame and this is the flammable oils burning off from the resin. You can keep the stick in your fire lighting kit ready to be used again in the future. Given that you only need a small amount of shavings to get a flame, it should last you a considerable amount of time. One of the most underrated items in my kit is a tube of porter wipes. This little tube contains 10 compressed tissues. And by compressed, I mean seriously compressed. Each tissue is about the diameter of a one pound coin. All you need to do is to add water to them and watch them expand into a pretty durable wipe, which you can use for cleaning your hands, washing your face, or even to help wipe excess blood off superficial wounds, providing you use sterile water, of course. They don't break up like normal tissues would. They are more of a wet wipe. It does say that they are biodegradable, but I still take them home to dispose of. They're an awesome piece of kit, even if you're just into camping and hiking and not the hardcore bushcraft and survival stuff. I find them really useful. I'm not sponsored by them. In fact, I was sent them by a subscriber years ago. I just genuinely use them regularly. You'll notice earlier I started a fire with a flint and steel. A benefit of this type of fire lighting is that it's reusable, much like a fire steel can be reused over and over again. The steel striker will give you thousands of sparks before it starts to fail you. The flint on the other hand will start to lose its sharpness after just a few uses. You can make your own flint shard fairly easily. Here is a piece of flint I found in the woods. It already has a fairly sharp edge where it's broken off from another larger piece and it can still throw off some sparks. However, if you use a larger stone and strike the flint in a downward motion, you can often crack off smaller shards of flint which are far sharper. The inner pieces of the flint have sharp edges. This will throw out good amounts of sparks before they dull. And now that one large piece of flint has been broken into multiple usable pieces which you can stow away in your fire lighting kit for later use. A more modern backup emergency fire lighting technique is the inner tube of a bicycle tire. This small piece keeps the lid secure on my flint and steel kit. If I am in real need of lighting a fire quickly, especially in adverse conditions like strong winds and rain, I can cut off a thin strip of the inner tube and then tie this into a knot and hold a lighter to it for a few seconds. Being rubber, it burns really well and allows enough time to burn through damp kindling. As it burns for a while, you only really need a small amount to build up a fire. The smoke it gives off is toxic, so I would only use this method of fire lighting in an emergency, but it is a great backup option to have. The Polish Lavu is one of my favorite pieces of kit. It's essentially two military ponchos that are buttoned together and they can be quickly deployed into a two person tent just by adding a center pole. They are made from canvas, which means they are really durable, but they're also on the heavy side. The ability to wear them as a poncho to protect you from the elements and then quickly deploy them into a tent 
makes them a versatile piece of kit to have. I've used mine in all sorts of conditions, including a multi-day winter snow camping trip. The armholes allow you to put a stovepipe through them, and if you have a collapsible stove, this adds to the compactness of this entire setup. I find canvas to be a great material for a tent. Despite it being heavy, it keeps you warm in the winter and cool in the summer. However, I would advise that you get some fire protective material to go around the arm sleeves if you are using a wood stove in there. Fire and canvas do not mix well. This particular woodland is damp all year round. This is evident from the dense patches of moss that are spread throughout. Trying to find dry tinder in environments like this can often be quite tricky. However, despite the ground being soaking wet, there is still a natural material that grows amongst it that can be made into a usable tinder once it has been prepared well enough. You'll notice the white blades of grass growing amongst the moss. If you focus on collecting the thin, broad blades of grass, these are often the driest. Gather a good handful of grass and rub it between your hands. After a few minutes, the heat that builds up between your hands will start to dry out the grass. If you continue to rip and break the fibres in between buffing it between your hands, it will help to make the tinder more fluffy, which is what you need for it to catch a spark from a fire steel or an ember from a bow drill. Continue to collect the grass, as more often than not, you need double the amount you think you need. Here is a quick tinder bundle made in around five minutes from picking up the wet grass. You'll see it is compact and it looks like a small bird's nest. And now just a few sparks from a ferro rod will help the tinder bundle to ignite. As the grass is quite damp, you'll need to add oxygen to help encourage it into a stronger flame. Thank you for watching this episode. If you're interested in this type of video, feel free to subscribe for more and check out my bushcraft and survival skills playlist in the video description below. Be sure to check out our sister YouTube channel, TA Fishing, for weekly fishing videos, as well as my vlogging channel, Life of Mike, for more behind the scenes and different content such as my military Land Rover project. Head to taoutdoors.com for my bushcraft and survival gear, and thank you very much for watching, I'll catch you guys in the next one.